All right, welcome everybody. Uh, today's Zoom catch up uh, is with Steve Martinez, uh, who is the founder of Live In. Uh, and again, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that know Steve. Um, but for those that you don't, we'll obviously start with our, you know, usual usual question of uh, give us your backstory, tell us tell us where you've been and where you're from and how you've ended up today. So, Steve, uh, welcome and uh, take it away. Thanks, Josh. Uh, yeah, look, I've been around. Well, knocking around travel for, you know, 20, 20 odd years. Uh, but I'll, I'll kind of give you a bit of a backstory just so you get a feel for what got me into travel because all of us here uh, are working in the industry because we deal with three types of people, right? It's people that have traveled, people that want to travel, um, or people that are traveling. Uh, you know, they're the three types of people which bring us all together. So, um, but kind of, you know, just a quick backstory, which, you know, which kind of leads me to today, which is quite interesting is uh, I dipped my feet into hospitality, working at the Sheraton on the Park Hotel, which is a big hotel in Sydney at the time. I think it's still there. Um, and worked there for a few years and became the youngest duty manager there. And uh, the good thing about that was, uh, uh, you know, the duty manager would have to deal with the worst things that ever happened in the hotel that the other managers couldn't. And the buck stopped with you. You know, things like uh, a Ferrari or, or a Porsche getting crashed by a Porter, you're having to go get that guy having lunch and pick him up, take him down to his $300,000 car that's been smashed and deal with that, all the way through to the hotel over booking and having a wedding couple walk up to you at 11.30 at night and having to walk a wedding couple. Um, you know, so that was really, that was a really interesting, uh, interesting time. Then I decided to get out of that and I started working for an American motivational speaker, same name as a Canadian prime minister, same last name, which is Trudeau, uh, first name Kevin. Kevin Trudeau, and I worked with him for a couple of years, and he was quite amazing, actually, um, full sales-driven American hyper-sales. Um, and working for him uh, was really interesting. Uh, he used to teach me about uh, how to remember things. He, he was on Oprah, for example, and he talked he talked to everybody in the green room, uh, which was 300 people in the audience, uh, for about 10 minutes, and then he'd make each and every one of them stand up uh, first and last name, because if you remember their name, he had a, a memory technique, which I used to sell uh, on infomercials. Um, so that was that was pretty cool. And then uh, that ended up really badly, actually, with the current affair following me around with cameras because the business went broke. Um, and I got left holding the pot here in Australia and he took off back to the States. Um, and then around that time, my girlfriend left me for four years and I decided I'd chuck everything in and try and go for this travel job. Uh, which is a company called Oz Experience back in the day, which was a green bus that used to go around Australia. Um, I knew nothing about travel. I'd never backpacked before. Um, I didn't really know what a backpacker was. I'd never been backpacking myself. And they sent me on, the, on a bus up the east coast of Australia with a letter. And they said, go on this bus first. Your first day is going to be on this bus. And when you get to Cairns, we'll fly you back. And that'll be a month after. And you can come back and then start selling this to travel agents. Um, so I came back off that trip, changed my life. Uh, you know, I really, really uh, was easy to tell travel agents about something that um, really had an impact on my life and traveling and the core of traveling. So that was really the catalyst uh, for me. And then uh, after working for several years with Oz Experience, uh, I moved on to a company called Raging Thunder, which is for those who did know or don't know, uh, hot air ballooning, whitewater rafting, kayaking, Fitzroy Island, you know, one of the largest adventure companies at the time. Um, and it's there that I did a lot of the international marketing and distribution uh, where the idea for Livid came up, uh, where Raging Thunder uh, at the time had agents all around the world, um, inbound wholesalers, we had agents in Australia, OTAs weren't really a thing at the time. Um, and we had a, a reservation system that we were using uh, to run all of our bookings and manifests and, and, and calendars and availability um, which was used across the business. Uh, and myself, uh, as a, a sales guy, I used to have to update all the international travel agents because availability, pricing, all via spreadsheets, emails, uh, not scalable, not sustainable, prone to mistakes. So that's when I came up with the idea of uh, using the reservation system as a source of truth to be able to distribute the company's information to all of its channels. Um, and kind of break it down for you a little bit this is a this is birth of living really at the time raging thunder didn't want to pay me anymore it was at the end of the financial crisis in 2008 or 9 
I didn't want to be that guy going to them and saying, hey, I've been with you for seven years, I want more money, it wasn't the right time. So what I did say to them was, if you let me go down to four days a week, um, but pay me the same, um, and I can use that extra day to start this idea I've got uh, of connecting a reservation system up uh, and, and being and get agents to be able to book things in, in real time. So what I did is uh, I found a developer. Um, uh, I looked at the processes of how tours and activities were booked at the time. Um, there was, you know, Flight Centre at the time when I used to walk into their stores uh, didn't have one single commission rate, which is the same across any experience. Uh, they had different payment terms. Uh, some vouchers took 24 hours, others took three days, some were instant. Um, it was really fragmented. There was different brochures from different suppliers up in each store. Uh, so what I said to Flight Centre at the time is, look, let me clean up this whole category for you. Um, if I give you a platform where everything's in one booking tool under the same commission rate, there's one way to pay. Uh, we can make it easier for travel agents. Uh, because at the time, the travel agents weren't booking tours because uh, it was too hard. You know, for a $60 Segway tour, um, you know, to be on the phone for an hour and with, with reconciling and vouchers, it just wasn't worth it. So, you know, people used to walk out the door uh, with an opportunity that could, uh, that could otherwise make the money. So what I did was I started connecting what these things are called in technology uh, is their APIs and every reservation system, uh, modern one has one and all it is, is a connection out to the outside world where you can actually access their calendars, their availability, their pricing, all in real time. Um, so I built Livin back then, which was a platform and we connected up all the cans suppliers first because they use one, one, one reservation system up there. Then we connected the reservation systems in the Whit Sundays uh, for the sailing. And then we connected the reservation systems in, uh, in New Zealand. We connected up the reservation systems for the rest of Australia. Uh, and then we were able to offer Flight Centre at the time, which is our first client, a platform where for the first time agents could actually log in, search for a tour, not have to call the supplier to say how many seats are available, um, uh, these are their names, uh, what days are they departing, how much is it, all that was done in a couple of seconds because it was all in real time on the tool. Um, so that's, that's, what we, that's what we did and um, it was really successful. We got travel agents for the first time really interested in the category because it wasn't hard. We took the pain away from it um, it was really quick for them to do and easy to do. Um, now, the system was built around all my knowledge of being a sales rep for so many years of knowing how these things are booked. And, you know, with technology, don't ever be scared about uh, the word technology. If you would have asked me nine years ago that I would have been leading a, a technology-driven API-connected business of tools and activities, I would have laughed in your face. You know, I was scared of technology. Um, I was great at relationships. I knew my stuff in terms of content around Australia and New Zealand and how things were done. I knew all the travel agent processes. But all technology really is, is taking something that's done manually and digitising it uh, in an efficient manner with technology. That's all it is. So this idea was really based on all my knowledge, bringing it together, finding a developer that understood what I wanted uh, and, and solved that problem for me. And, uh, and so that's, that's, that's how Living was built. 2015, we got private equity funding and for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's, uh, it's very wealthy individuals that put uh, money into Living to grow it. Um, so then we, uh, we scaled internationally. And what I mean by that is uh, not only were we, were we selling Australia and New Zealand products, we started connecting up to the reservation system and the inventory of international tools and activities. Um, and today, uh, as a result of that funding and that support, um, we are connected to about 22 reservation systems globally. Um, we've got products in every country, um, products like the Louvre, you know, uh, Iceland, you know, uh, Northern Lights. Uh, in Italy, we've got, you know, Rome, Colosseum, everything like that in South America. Uh, we've got Asia, Asia Pacific as well, so we're quite a big platform now. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you go onto the tool, um, you can find offerings anywhere um, around the world, all connected in real time, all based around the travel agents' workflows. So, uh, so that's what that's uh, that's what got me here, and that's what living is. Where'd the name come from? Really interesting question. <laughs> 
So the name LIV, IN, was taken at the time because the first thing when you create a business is you, you kind of go, oh, okay, what about this name? And you search for company names and, and uh, URLs. That's the first thing you do and you get really excited. It's quite a good process. And LIVIN.com was taken. Uh, but what wasn't taken was LIVN. And the reason we wanted to call it Livin was if you kind of broke it down, it stood, it stood for Live Inventory Network, L-I-V-I-N. Um, so Live Inventory Network, Livin was the original IN we tried to go for. We couldn't get that. So we ended up with the shortened version, which, version, which is L-I-V-N, which actually is pretty cool. Uh, so that's where the name came from. Because Livin with the I, that's the, that's the charity? Is that? It's, uh, I think it's a... It's a crypto business. I think it's uh, right. it's uh, it does something along the lines of rewards. So it's a little bit different. But L I V N is us, and Living I think is a, is another company I've seen around uh, mm -hmm. that that does not travel, not travel. That's uh, yeah, it's interesting. I guess backstory and interesting journey to get to where you are today, Steve. Which is, uh, yeah, it's 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 great to see that you know, as you said, you you know, you weren't a tech person by any stretch of the imagination and and obviously you know just knowing what you wanted and, and knowing a problem that you could solve for for agents which we all are grateful for um i caught the caught the end of it when i was still on the front line myself but i, I do remember it coming on board and and being so excited to have a tool that you know that did get you as you said engaged in and booking those day trips and making the process a lot easier so um you know on behalf of everyone maybe you know <laughs> thank you well done um but uh, how's, uh, how's the situation going for you at the moment? How's, how's you know, social distancing and, you know, the world we're living in at the moment, how's that, how's that working out for you? Yeah, look, it's been a, a really tough transition for everybody. Uh, they, they moved, you know, for anybody that's got kids as well, you know, the, the schooling system in Australia got moved online within three days, um, which is a significant change. And don't forget all this happened at the same time as people were not allowed to go to work. So all of a sudden you had a home office or, or two, in a house full of kids, um, not enough devices. Um, so, you know, it was a really tough transition, I'd say, I, for everybody. I'm sure everyone can agree the first three or four weeks of it, you know, at the same time as not knowing whether we could feed our own family or pay rent um, or what, what the world would look like. It was pretty scary. So, um, you know, the entry into it was, was certainly rough, um, but as times progressed, uh, you know, th things have settled down. Um, uh, Certainly social distancing, I think it's funny now talking about it in May, uh, but if you were to ask me in March, um, I was going to the petrol station and I wouldn't touch the Bowser unless I could get, you know, a glove or, 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 or a, a tissue to, to grab the Bowser. I, you know, I was a lot more conscious back then, uh, but you only have, you know, anyone that's gone and ventured outside to a shopping centre or a supermarket over the weekend in the last couple of weeks, Australia seems to have forgotten. Um, very complacent, which is a bit of a concern. Um, I'm always at a guy that looks at the silver lining with that is that if it's any indication from what I've seen in people's behaviour in the next, in the last couple of weeks, um, people have forgotten about it. It's like, what virus? What are you talking about? Um, people are going back to normal fairly quickly, which is scary. Um, but at the same time, if you're in travel and you want things to bounce back quickly, looking at the silver lining, that tells me that people are going to go back to normal. Um, they're not going to worry about what was a month ago. Um, it's really obvious to me that's what's going to happen. Um, and that snapback that people were talking about, although it's going to be a lot smaller because of the opportunities available to us with people moving around the world, um, the desire and, and the willingness for people to go back to normal, I think, has already been shown by all of our experiences in the last couple of weeks. So I expect that to, um, to continue into travel. Um, the, you know, Mother's Day was interesting. I couldn't hug my mother on Mother's Day, although I could see her, um, which was hard. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, the kids have taken well to it as well. They're actually better than I am. They're educating me. They, I, I keep, tend to keep forgetting them, uh, at the supermarket. I'm lining up a little bit too close to the people in front of me. So I've got the kids to remind me to social distance at the moment. Yeah. My, uh, my six year old's the, uh, the social distancing police in our house. He's uh, he's all over it. He, one point five meters. He'll he'll uh, he'll pull you up on it real quick if you're if you're anywhere where you're not not displaying it. Oh so. look, uh, you know, on the Mother's Day card, one of the kids, which is he's seven, he wrote, uh, "Dear Mummy, thanks for keeping me safe safe from COVID nineteen," uh, <laughs> which uh, which would go down in the history books. I think that card. Absolutely. 
And obviously you said, you know, schools and, and obviously businesses and everyone had to, had to adapt really, really quickly, um, you know, when certain uh, decisions were made, you know, for us, you know, whether it was the, the borders closing or, or certain things, you know, not being able to operate, you know, restaurants, gyms, those sorts of things, you know, how's, how's all that affected, you know, living as a, as a business, you know, your team and, and the day-to-day operations of it? What's, um, what's that look like for you guys at the moment? Yeah, well, look, if you cast your mind back to about late Feb, um, and the trigger for living when we knew that this was really serious um, was an early flag uh, when ITB in Berlin was cancelled. You know, you've got 130,000 delegates from all over the world. Uh, for the travel industry, which is usually positive, resilient, they've seen it all before, for uh, an a event of that magnitude um, from players all, on the, all around the world in travel to cancel and to give in to, you know, being uh, positive about it and let's keep traveling and get through this. That was the first real flag uh, because uh, travel or people in the industry were the ones to protect it for the longest possible time. So that was the earliest flag for us. And the next day, the Louvre Museum in Paris closed. Uh, Again, you know, wow, uh, that's never happened before. Um, So we knew this was serious. Um, and uh, we, uh, we very early on, we, we uh, had a meeting with uh, the senior leaders of the company, um, which was a crisis meeting at the time, but we felt we had time. At that time, things were moving slow. Um, and we, we really got prepared uh, very early. We, we started looking at parts of the business uh, that, I guess, over the time that it's been going, it just, you know, you grow in areas where you not necessarily were nice to haves or you or they grow or they're inefficient in certain parts of the business. So we started looking at that. Um, And then, um, you know, our mission back then was to get ahead of it, to go to our investors before they come to us with a plan of this is happening, we can see it coming, but that's fine because this is our plan. And a week and a half later, while we're trying to prepare for this, uh, what seemed to be something that we had a lot of time to present, the investors, uh, we were two weeks behind. Um, It moved so quickly. Um, Every day we saw, and there was one day I was watching the news feeds uh, on someone in the office, um, and it was all of the airlines being grounded, like the whole page of the feed. I think it was travel, it didn't matter what you looked at, travel Mm -hmm. daily or it was skiffed or um, uh, this is closed, airlines uh, lowering capacity. uh, And then, you know, it was was really, really uh, uh, scary. so what, what Livin did was looked at, uh, you know, we have, uh, at the time we had 40, 40 staff. Um, and so we, uh, we cut the business, I guess, set by seven, by seven people initially. Um, and then, you know, as, as, and this is before the government announced JobKeeper as well. So we, we thought we were doing that. And then, so we made them redundant. Um, but then JobKeeper came around two days later. Uh, so we're trying to work out, you know, how, how to do that. So we brought those guys back on, which is nice. Um, and everybody else is on reduced hours like uh, the rest of the world, um, three days a week um, until things pick up again. Um, everybody in the company understood that there was a necessity for the company to preserve cash flow and to be in a position when, which was uncertain at the time and, and with a little bit more certainty now, but uh, we wanted to be in a position where we were uh, uh, stronger uh, when we did come out of it uh, by conserving uh, cash. Uh, and, you know, as everybody knows, um, everyone was really willing and helping to do that. Um, and we've got, uh, we've got a lot of things, I guess, that we're still working on. Um, as you might not think so, but, you know, don't forget the uh, engineering part of our business is huge. You know, we've got uh, 12 full-time um, uh, uh, developers that are always connecting systems. Um, so we can go into that a little bit later, but um, yeah, we've, we've certainly slowed down uh, the business, working on things that we believe are going to be uh, uh, fruitful on the other side of this and positioning ourselves well. Um, and we believe that this, uh, this, this incident is, is going to actually uh, put a spotlight on the business and what we've been preaching for a very long time. Um, it's going to be a lot easier for us to be able to explain what we do and the benefits of it coming out the other side of it. And what about the, I guess, the interaction or, or connection with the agents and agencies out there at the moment? What's, what's living with those reduced, you know, um, hours and working and those sorts of things? How are you guys managing um, that side of it? 
So the I would say like on the on the distribution part, which is the agent part, um, not much at all. Uh, that's all. That all seems to be has gone into hibernation. Um, you know, I haven't heard much from the. I've got a team of people that look after that, but I'm very close to everything. I always have been a bit of a bit of a control freak, so I like to know what's going on. And um, and you know, really a lot a lot of the travel agents that we've worked with. Uh, uh, look, Flight Centre was a big client of ours. We, we all know that, that they've gone through a very difficult time of, of reducing their work, uh, their, their stores. Um, so we've been keeping up to date uh, from them of which stores are open and who's in them um, and those sorts of things. Very operational um, in terms of, you know, it's not the right time to be talking to, or hasn't been the right time to be talking to agents about the future uh, till now. Um, I think that would have been misguided. Um, to, to think otherwise, because there was a, you know, there was a, a survival, it has been up until now. Um, are we going to survive this? How are we going to survive this? What do we need to do? Who's still going to be around? Um, now, we're, now I believe we're, we're past that. Uh, everybody's looking at uh, a little bit of the future now. So I think now's the time that we'll start to engage the agents. Most of the engagement from our side has been around the end travel service providers or the two operators um, to try and gauge when they think they'll come back. Um, in terms of offering their tours. Um, I've been uh, quite close to ground with that, you know, myself calling all of the operators that I know just in Australia to see where they're at. Um, still a little bit, uh, you know, it's a little bit cloudy. They're waiting for, for government advice uh, on when they can, uh, when they can reopen. Um, a few of them are a little bit more optimistic than others, um, you know, but you've got to think it's a very complex area for operations. You know, you've got a skydive. Uh, where you, you're inside, well, you've got, first of all, you've got an instructor strapped to your back, which is, you know, right on you. Um, then you've got all the spit of the uh, of the person doing the activity going into the skydiver space um, on the way down. And you've got people in the plane in close proximity. Um, and you've got a bus that take people to that skydive. So really complex area where, there's a, where the operators want to do the right thing and they're trying to figure out how they can comply with both the law and what people's expectations and to remove the fear of the customer, uh, which is really what we're trying to deal with here. Um, and then you have other operations, which are, you know, Great Barrier Reef operations, which are fine, they're outdoor, uh, but the boat needs to travel two hours to get out there. So they're looking at things like how far apart people need to be in a boat. Their lunches have always been buffets. I think they're a thing of the past, you know, so there's changes that have to happen there. How do they clean their snorkel equipment? How do they clean their dive equipment? Um, these are very complex uh, areas, uh, and I've been talking to them. From all accounts, it certainly seems like uh, most of the operators are looking at, uh, well, Queensland seems to be a little bit ahead of everybody at the moment, uh, just due to the uh, relaxing of some of the lockdowns. Um, and, you know, what I've been hearing is from mid-July, August, you know, in line with school holidays, um, is, is what seems to be the operators getting ready for. What is frustrating at the moment is the operators are focused on their operations and what day they will depart. Um, what I keep saying to them is we need to know what you're doing so we can communicate that back through our network on is your trip safe? You got hand sanitizer, are you doing a buffet? Are you using are you, you know, are you running at full capacity on your boats or are you gonna have limited departures? So so I'm trying to get the operators to realise that yes, I know you've got to figure out what you're gonna do when you're operating, but the industry needs to know that people are gonna be searching and booking this stuff a month, month and a half before. Steve, has there been any chats? We had a chat to J Ride um, the other day. Has there been any sort of conversation around like a, a certification type thing? Like, you know, health security is being a bit of a, a trending word. Do you feel like there is talk or chatter around needing a stamp of some sort to say that you're, you know, COVID safe or, you know, you've got your health security certificate so that those agents and customers can everyone can feel confident that, you know, all those operators are safe to, to use? For anyone that's an entrepreneur out there, this is a fantastic business opportunity for somebody because the operators I've spoken to have no idea what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, uh, how they're going to comply. They've just started thinking about it this week, thinking about it, not doing anything about it. Um, the best plan I heard, and believe it or not, we, we you know, and we deal with some really large companies, you know, reputable ones. Um, the best thing I heard uh, in terms of that was uh, two competitors talking to each other, saying that they both wouldn't operate until they both came up with, in, in collaboration, uh, a COVID safe plan. Um, but they still hadn't none of that out yet. So um, I think it's a huge opportunity 
for someone to create some sort of certification or stamp of approval with parameters, you know, maybe four or five uh, parameters that suppliers must meet to get this stamp. Um, because what we're dealing with here is fear. Um, is, is and, and we have to remove that fear from people wanting to do a particular activity. And the only way we can do that is by conveying the information of a supplier, meaning a particular criteria or standard, that's non-existent at the moment. Uh, people are using uh, government websites, suppliers using government websites, which differ. Um, and there's a real opportunity for someone to come in here um, and, and, and take the lead. Uh, risky, because you know, you, you, you've got to look at liability. Uh, and there's more to it as well. You know, a COVID safe plan also means um, if, you know, if somebody can, of one of your staff contracts uh, uh, the, the COVID-19, um, you know, how do you manage your social media strategy? What's your plan around that? So it goes beyond just what you're going to do on the day. It's how you communicate. Uh, what's your crisis strategy if the worst case does happen? Um, and there's a certain amount of responsibility that comes with uh, presenting these to the customers as well. So I think there's a, there's a bit of fear in terms of... Look, I think that's in line with some other stuff we've been talking about, Steve, with the travel agents themselves, um, you know, around commission recall, uh, booking fees, you know, obviously we've seen the backlash and, and the news stories and those sorts of things come up. Um, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, the recent news come up around the after um, stuff. So, you know, like you just said, you know, those two suppliers working together to figure out, you know, how they can both work to a place where they both feel comfortable and confident that they can operate. It's almost the same thing that, you know, we, we're trying to, I guess, as an industry and this, we're all in this together concept is that to create certainty and to create um, a place where people aren't fearful to travel, to book travel, to get on a plane, to do day trips, to do all those things, we do need some form of cohesion, um, you know, together. Um, and I guess to put down the put down the swords and and you know work together so that everybody has a place to to operate and to to work and to to be part of the industry. So it's interesting that you know although the frontline agent to the to the you know the day tour operator or the skydive operator, you know there's polar differences between their day to day operations. But really, as far as the industry is concerned, it's, it's it's still the same stuff. You know we want to give people confidence to book with us, um, and we want to have confidence to book. Um, the, the, you know, the day trips and the, and the tours. Yeah, yeah. Look, and I think it's going to be, you know, it, 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 it's a bit of common sense as well, you know. If you, if you think about uh, the first experiences that, you know, people are likely to be comfortable doing, um, you know, they're going to be outdoors ones. They're going to be, you know, Mount Wellington mountain bike descents. Um, they're going to be a kayaking tour where, you know, the, there's even spacing and you're outdoors. Great Barrier Reef trips, uh, and walking tours. Um, national park tours, you know, those sorts of things. I think it's fairly obvious which ones are going to be within the comfort zone initially of those. Um, so what we're doing is, yeah, we're, we're targeting those businesses, which are the ones that I've been talking to this week, because we see those ones as the first ones that people will, will uh, I guess, gravitate towards in terms of wanting to do and feel comfortable doing um, and, and seeing what their, uh, what their thoughts were around, uh, around that. But there's certainly, look, there certainly is an opportunity. We're trying to play a role in that, but it is difficult um, because we do work with over a thousand suppliers globally. Um, but what we are trying to do is tackle it within Australia first um, and to see what we can do there. And we're just taking it very carefully because there could be you know, a certain amount of, I guess, there's a certain amount of responsibility with, uh, with guaranteeing a, a level of safety. Um, and you've just got to make sure that, you know, you're not putting yourself or the business in a position or the travel agent in a position where, um, you know, of a responsibility uh, if something, you know, of the worst case scenario happens if someone does contract one of these, uh, off one of these uh, tours. So, you know, we're, we're looking at it seriously. We've got a team of people on it now um, and it's, 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 it's going to be a lot of work, but we're working hard to at least bring a subset of, of, of standards out there that we can actually uh, measure up our suppliers against and confidently put them front and centre to begin with. Yeah, and I think even just for agents to start thinking about, um, like you said, some common sense, um, you know, experiences and tours that are going to make people feel confident and safe um, is what they should be thinking about, in, you know, with recommendations or, you know, if they're advertising certain tours or day trips on their social medias or, or whatnot. 
um, whatever product they're thinking about putting in front of their customer, you know, use that sort of common sense, um, you know, that will, will resonate with the customers as a confident thing that they can um, they can do or, or try. So I think that's um, it's good advice, even without a, a stamp or a seal of approval. Um, it's at least something to get thinking. Um, yeah, if, if you process. put your mind to it, absolutely. You know, there's you know we're in Australia. You know, it's uh, it's an outdoor thing. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there uh, that we can we can be doing. And for, for Live In, I mean, you guys are obviously working pretty hard on what's happening right now and starting to think about, you know, the, the next few months and, and how to open those doors again and, and what you, you and your um, operators need to be doing to, to get people confident to get back on in the travelling space. Have you guys thought, you know, even further ahead of that? Have you got some big picture stuff that you were working on or, you know, have you got some ideas on what, you know, 2021 and, and onwards could look like? Um, look, yeah, there's certainly a long game for the business. Um, and that, that, I guess, hasn't changed. It's just been brought forward, actually. Um, you know, when there's not as much noise going on with, we call it BAU, business as usual. Um, it gives you a lot of time to focus on a lot of other things without the noise. So, you know, if anything, we've brought forward uh, a few things. Um, but um, certainly for, for, you know, it, Short term, uh, the business is is focusing on Australia and New Zealand inventory. Um, it's very obvious to everybody that that's where the, that the opportunity lies. Um, for, for the travel agents out there as well, it's, you know, what a great opportunity, you know. I used to always wonder, how could you work at a flight centre with that many brochures, of that many offerings, that many airports all around the world and be expected to know all that when someone asks you a question about an obscure place. Always, always wondered. That's what I find amazing about travel agents. They didn't know they'd find out. For the first time, uh, there's an opportunity to focus on one or two destinations and get your knowledge up. You know? And what a, dest what a destination, Australia. Um, you know, 35,000 kilometres of coastline. Uh, we've got, you know, the oldest indigenous race in, in the world in 40,000 years. In our own country, uh, whiter sand beach in the world at Hines Beach. You know we've got a lot of those. Easternmost point in Australia, you know, is Cape Byron kayaks, oldest rainforest in the world, the Daintree. Um, you know the lowest point in Australia, which is Lake Eyre, 15 metres below sea level, like Perth, the most isolated city in the world. Um, just think about, you know, we've got an amazing country with amazing experiences to sell. And I think, uh, I think certainly short term, there's a huge opportunity for the travel agents to, you know, only have to educate themselves on, you know, one or two destinations predominantly, as opposed to trying to know a little bit about everything. And there's a real opportunity there. Um, and, you know, you certainly can't forget there's, you know, 25% of the Australian population travels overseas a year, right? Um, that's 6 million people. So those 6 million people ain't going to be going anywhere in the next year. So, you know, all those flights that the travel agents have been selling to, to, to Rome or, or to LA or, or to South America, um, the same amount of opportunities there, it's just redirected to another destination. So, um, yes, the demand's going to be lower, of course. People are, you know, aren't going to have as much annual leave. But you think about... Uh, the amount of money someone would spend to go on a holiday just to, I guess, I don't know, pick a destination, two people, America, two weeks, I don't know, what is it, 10, 12 grand, you know, yeah. right? Well, imagine what you could do with 12 grand in Australia, you know, domestic flight, bunch of experiences, like, so, you know, the opportunity is huge. Um, I'm, I'm an optimist, you know, I hope, I hope I'm right. Um, but that six million people that were going to other places in the world that aren't anymore, uh, they've been cooped up for a while and they're going to want to go. Um, and the cost of it is going to be a lot lower than what it otherwise would have been. So the pot, if you want to call it that, is still as big, in my view. Um, and for the first time, you know, predominantly, they only have an opportunity to travel to one or two destinations or countries, which would be, you know, Australia or New Zealand by the way it's looking. So great opportunity for travel agents to focus their knowledge on, you know, the obvious things that are in front of us right now. And maybe thinking about that, you know, the experiences and that experiential style travel as the, as the starting point, um, as opposed to necessarily that new country or that new destination or that, you know, I've always wanted to go to Italy, you know, conversation. And then you, you boil down to some of those experiential um, style 
you know, tours or, you know, underground uh, walking trips or behind the scenes in the Vatican or, or whatnot, you get there at the end, but that may not necessarily be the reason why they wanted to go to Italy in the first place. Whereas I guess using, you know, a platform like Live In or, or getting your knowledge up um, around some of those experiential tours and, and experiences that we have here in Australia, that could be the starting point. And then you kind of build the trip around that, you know, and, and, you know, I don't know where I want to go. I just want to go and do something, but I've done this and I've done that. Well, Hey, did you know you could do this in this destination? Um, you know, how about we build a trip around, you know, being able to experience that, you know, doing, doing something that's a once in a lifetime um, opportunity as opposed to, as I said, that destination being the, the, the catalyst for the conversation or the starting point. So. That's kind of my thoughts around it anyway. Yeah. And I think for once, uh, you know, a benefit of a lot of Aussies never really seeing their backyard, which you've always whinged about, is, you know, it's such a beautiful country and we don't see it. Um, this is our opportunity. You know, the next year, a lot of Aussies are going to, are going to want to taste for it. Um, and sorry, I, we, we kind of digressed a little bit. Uh, kind of diverted a little bit, but kind of going back to your question of what Libin's doing to, to prepare um, is, uh, you know, we are, we're scaling up our platform connectivity uh, uh, significantly by, by about 30-fold uh, in the next year and a half uh, by re-architect, re redesigning our whole platform, uh, which we're writing at the moment. We have been for the last five months. We just brought that forward. Um, and that's releasing in uh, December this year which will allow us to be able to sell a, a wider array of, of in more flexible ways um, uh, on the interface that we have. Um, and so that's, that's exciting for us. So we brought our engineering forward, our connectivity to more systems uh, forward, uh, which will give us more inventory uh, all in real time. Uh, and, you know, we, we're, we're, we're quite, quite a large global player now. Um, we're the only real platform that has 100% real-time connectivity with all of its suppliers. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty exciting. Um, and even more so than ever, you know, we've been watching China really closely and China has always been a movie that's been playing out ahead of us and that becomes our movie, you know, scene by scene, if you've kind of seen what's happened right from the beginning. And if you start looking at, the, you know, the first public holiday they had over there, which was last week, um, some of the statistics coming out of there are interesting. And these are the things that are going to happen over here. Um, the Great Wall of China opened up, uh, but only limited, they can, limited capacity to, to, to 30% of what they normally would. Um, it, uh, the uh, Disneyland Shang, uh, Shanghai opened up last week, sold out within three hours, given a smaller capacity, but it sold out. Um, now, that demand is going to be there and the capacities are going to be lower on all the experiences. That's a given. Um, what would normally carry 20 people will be a lot lower, which means it's, a, it's simple economics, right? Supply and demand. Um, if there's only 10 seats available on that, where there used to be 30, they're likely to sell out. So that creates a little bit of urgency. So there is a real need for people to be able to book in advance now because capacity is more limited, which is basic economics. If you don't book now, you'll miss a seat. Um, and, and that's a reality coming our way. So, you know, the real-time connectivity we have to the booking systems to be able to access exactly how many seats are available at the time is going to really come into its own with us. I think that's going to be quite beneficial to be able to give the travel agents that technology and that power um, because you're going to want to secure your seats ahead of, uh, of, of landing in these places because they're going to be operating every single day and at the capacities that they were. So um, we're certainly, you know, preparing our, 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 our comeback, you know, using that, that strength. And, I, and I'd highly recommend the, uh, the travel agents out there, uh, you know, look at these sort of tools to help them uh, because these are going to be, these are going to be issues coming our way. Um, face masks in China, you know, mandatory at theme parks at the moment. Um, uh, online pre-purchase ticketing only, no manual ticket purchases at booths, those sorts of things, so it's contactless. Um, they're all things that are happening out of China. Um, there's some, in, uh, some good news in flights, in air coming out of China in terms of uh, capacity um, and volumes. Um, so, uh, you know, we know it's going to happen here. Um, it's certainly going to happen domestically, first of all. And, and the, signs, the signs are good. It's just going to probably be at a third of what it what it normally was in both capacity and volume, which is what's happening in China. It's kind of like the, the 10 people that you can um, get into a restaurant this, uh, this weekend, weekend in Queensland, you know, everyone's trying to get a booking at a table to go and get a, 
go and get a palmy and a beer um, sat down somewhere. So, you know, um, that urgency will come, you know, once the, once the travel starts as well, um, which, is, which is important. And again, for a share of wallet, um, for travel agents, you know, a lot of people are hurting. A lot of, you know, sole traders, independent guys out there have reduced their income to, to next to nothing. Um, so, you know, if it is only domestic bookings, you know, in New Zealand that we are um, doing, it's really important that, you know, everything's getting booked for those customers um, prior, um, not only for the, for the agent, but also for, for the person that's, you know, decided to go to Broome or, or Cairns or wherever, they don't want to get there and miss out on doing the, you know, three or four top um, things on their list to do um, because they didn't book in advance um, because of that yeah, capacity. And, and, so. That's for real, you know, for a lot of the time, I know a lot of us have used this as well as pitch where, you know, you've got a client sitting in front of you and you say, if you don't book now, you'll, you'll probably miss out. But I, I honestly think that's going to be a reality when we come back because, you know, Forex Brewery Tour in Brisbane, you know, they take tours, they're going to be on limited capacity mm. as, well, as well as those broom tours, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, and a lot of those were, were, you know, were challenging to get on anyway when it was abundant. So, um, you know, even more reason to, to lock that stuff in, which is, which is great. Hey, Steve, I think, um, you know, you've given us a huge amount of value um, today already and it's great to hear more about the living business, where it came from, where it's going and, and you know, how it can really support um, travel agents out there at the moment and obviously when the, when the borders start to open up. Have you got any uh, words of wisdom or, or tips or advice or anything just for, for everybody out there in general at the moment on, you know, what they should be doing in this time or, or could be doing or, or should be thinking about, you know, um, personally and professionally getting ready for, ready for the other side? Yeah, look, there's, there's a few, I guess, personal things really, you know, in terms of uh, what I've found helpful. Um, in, in travel, the, you know, the, the, your job's never done. Um, and, and certainly speaking from a male perspective, and I speak for a lot of males here um, as well, is, is we like to close loops. You know, we, that's why we like mowing the lawn because you can start mowing the lawn, you can finish it and it's done. And you can be stand back and have a beer and be really proud of it and take that moment because that thing's done. Um, and in travel, things are never done. You know, they're always continuing. There's people leaving, there's training, there's new customers coming in, there's always things to do. So it's actually a really good opportunity to close a lot of those loops that fire around in your brain, you know. And the longer you leave those loops going, and what I'm talking about is unfinished tasks or those tasks that you put off, you know, I've got to clean my car. Uh, I've got to clean my bedroom. I've got to make my bed. Uh, I should make a soup and store it in the fridge for the next week. I should go visit my mother. I should, all these things, you know, like there's probably 150 things like that, you know, looping around your brain until you actually close them. So this is a nice opportunity to close a lot of those loops because we have got time and, and it does work, you know, um, one at a time, pick the hardest ones first, not the easiest ones first. That's the technique. Um, Things like, you know, I mentioned it before, cleaning cleaning your house and having a clean environment does wonders for your mind as well. It really does. Anyone that's recently cleaned their car or cleaned their, cleaned their house or their room, uh, it really does free up a lot of extra space in your mind. And those, those simple things that we could all be doing that we avoid, they make significant differences to someone's uh, mental space. Um, and you know, it's a good time to connect with people as well. I've been, uh, I've been guilty of this as the business has grown. Uh, I've stopped, you know, I guess, communicating with a lot of people that I've been communicating with for many, many years in the travel industry. Um, and it actually took someone to call me the other day to say, you know, have I done something wrong? And I'm like, no, why? Uh, and he's like, you just I haven't really talked to you. I feel like our relationship's changed. And I'm just like, man, I'm busy. You know, I've got kids, I've got a business and, um, it's no excuse, you know, so I've been, uh, I've been trying to reconnect out of the blue, just calling people that I haven't called for a few years to see how they're doing. Um, you know, it makes a big difference to both them. Uh, and it's really lovely to, to, to see how people are going and how they're dealing with things as well. And that, and that makes you feel nice because you're doing something, uh, well, not an email, not a text, you know, pick up the phone. Remember, the, the phone does make phone calls. Let's not forget <laughs> about that. Um, that's what it is. You dial in nine or ten numbers into it, magically someone else speaks on the other side. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't forget you've got that because that's quite personal. That's good. I think it's great advice. And I always wondered why I got so excited about mowing the lawn. It uh, definitely does feel good at the end of it. And, and look, to be honest, we've had a few people, um, you know, when we've asked this similar question, you know, about cleaning out the closet or, you know, doing that one thing that they've been putting off for ages. And it does make you feel good. So, 
um, you know, you know, cleaning the house or, or the car or, or whatnot. So I think that's really good advice um, and it's a good reminder. So thanks for that. And uh, lastly, possibly if you, if you can think of anybody, um, you know, a nomination or two um, of who you think would, would also like to jump on and, and add some value and, and contribute to what we're trying to achieve here. Yeah, look, I think I've got, I've got two people. Uh, I think someone quite valuable uh, would be really interesting to hear from would be uh, Ryan Hanley, and he's from a company called Trevello. Uh, and Trevello's got, uh, uh, they're a social network for travellers uh, where you can connect with travellers as you're travelling. They've got a user base of, you know, almost a million, I think a million uh, app users. Uh, and uh, his story is fantastic uh, and where what he's achieved with the company. Um, They've got an enormous amount of information on where where these people are right now, what they're talking about online during the lockdown. I think I think it'd be interesting just to kind of get a get a get a bit of data that's real um, from sentiment and what's going on. It also the story of Travello, which is which is good, and very interesting. And uh, the other one I I, I guess is uh, is a guy called Sean Martin. Now Sean Martin I met when he used to work at STA about. 20 years ago uh, in a shopping centre. Um, and Sean, most recently through his years, became, he was the general manager of, of Universal Traveller or the ex-student flights. Um, and now he's taken on a new position within Flight Centre, which is very interesting as well. But hearing Sean's point of view, because he's been on the coalface of both being a travel agent all the way up to uh, upper management and leadership level, um, as well as you know now having to deal with what the future looks like and some of the strategies that that perhaps some of the companies he's working for right now may be looking at um, and what they and what they believe travel might look like on the other side i think he'll be able to contribute quite a lot um, and really resonate with uh with the guys on this uh on this facebook group yeah great i think for yeah both two really um great people and and really different stories but um, yeah, I think they'll add huge amounts of value. So we hope that they, uh, they can jump on as well. Steve, uh, I think we'll leave it there, but uh, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I know you're still um, deep in it and still very, very busy working hard on the business and, and getting, it, uh, getting it ready for the other side. Um, so we absolutely appreciate your time today. Um, and, you know, let's hope to, to catch up on the other side, um, you know, when this is all, is all over. Thank you, Josh. All right. Thanks, Steve. Cheers.